Hi, um, hi guys, welcome to our talk. Um, so it's uh, Federated Monitoring Leveraging Open Source Technologies. So um, uh, uh, first let me introduce ourselves. Like uh, I'm Akil John, I'm a cloud support engineer working with Platform 9. So I have my colleague along with me. Hey, this is Sanchit Pathak. Uh, I work with Ajon as a cloud support engineer at Platform 9 Systems. Yeah, so let's get started. Like, um, let's start with like, why do we need monitoring and uh, what do we monitor? So uh, as we know, monitoring is, uh, is very important in making sure the workload deployed in infrastructure is working as expected, like uh, making sure the business is running smoothly. So to understand uh, which services bringing in more profit or, you know, or loss to the company. So that's where which monitorings really help. So, um, so the, uh, that's how we identify the value and the effective resource. So uh, there are, uh, to maintain this, we have like four uh, major usual aspects that we need to monitor from our systems. So they are like uh, latency, traffic, error, and saturation. So I'll uh, explain a bit more on that. Uh, latency is like uh, identifying which system, uh, if a system is suffering from responding to the queries or request. Um, uh, and in terms of the traffic, like uh, we can understand how many requests or response that are coming to the system. And uh, uh, with that, we'll be able to identify uh, mainly the pattern of traffic flow. And uh, for others, this is like uh, understand what kind of errors are reported in the system um, because this becomes a very common factor. And when it comes to a very complex uh, distributed environment, it is, uh, it is not an easy to understand because the logs would be, you know, uh, the errors would be, uh, collect, has to be collected from distributed systems. So um, this is this is a, another important uh, aspect that we need to monitor. And the last uh, the last point is left saturation. It's, it's just like uh, identifying the trend. So this gives us more information or idea about the trend, like what uh, service or application has been highly or you know, least used. Uh, and based on that information, we can scale up or change or uh, design our business accordingly. So saturation also plays a very important role uh, in terms of uh, monitoring. So that is uh, one of the, I mean, last uh, uh, major aspects in, uh, in monitor. Yeah, so let's move to the next slide. Um, so uh, here we'll discuss about the challenges uh, with the primitive monitoring systems. So uh, the major challenge that we had with the primitive monitoring was like, uh, we uh, were not able to get or monitor the uh, application, the service which is running in the infrastructure. So um, uh, pr with primitive style, we had some agents running, uh, agents would be installed and it will be running. It will be only collecting the metrics or the host data within that specific uh, host where this application is running. So uh, with those details alone, it becomes um, very difficult to get more understanding about what uh, specific service or application has been uh, mostly used in terms of the resource or um, uh, uh, the say uh, all the resources or the uh, uh, resource that been used so uh, or uh, or if there is an issue to the business logic or the application logic which is causing or which is contributing to any of the issue so such information uh, was not able to be fetched with the primitive style of monitoring uh, when it comes to a modern, um, you know, uh, distributed environment, say, let's take an example of a DevOps. Uh, it becomes very complex to handle and needed more automation. Um, say there are hundreds of processes running on the server nodes and in an interconnected fashion. So uh, maintaining such a setup uh, to run smoothly and without any downtime was very challenging. Um, so uh, let's uh, imagine that complex infrastructure with many servers being distributed over different locations and having no insights into what is happening in the hardware level or the application level like say uh, errors uh, res uh, response latency or say hardware uh, overload or out of resources so this this uh, situation makes it very difficult uh, to trace like what is uh, what is act uh, actually causing it with the primitive monitoring style um like uh, one of one of them can crash and cause a failure to other services uh, and when there are so many moving pieces there's a need of quickly identifying what exactly might have gone wrong and uh, uh, 
uh, would be a time consuming when it comes to debugging because uh, the only data that we have at the moment is in terms of the metrics of the host, right? So uh, that's where it becomes more time consuming. And when it comes to, uh, we won't be able to attain the uh, very, very less uh, downtime or a, a zero downtime. So, uh, uh, so just to conclude, like we need more data, more than just the metrics and the host data. As the application these days are not monolithic, uh, uh, in a complex set of different, uh, you know, uh, distributed um, environment, we have microservices running together, and this becomes very complex. And uh, the primitive uh, style of methods becomes uh, and not matching to the current uh, uh, distributed environment that we have. So let's move to the next slide. So uh, we have this VM does not revolutionize the application. So I'll let my colleague to talk more about this. Okay, thank you, Ajo. So as my colleague mentioned that now uh, the applications have transitioned from a monolithic architecture to a microservices architecture. Let's let's try and go through that journey as to how how that revolution basically took place. So even though in the past decade or so we have seen that there has been a, a widespread adoption of VMware and other other virtual machine platforms, which did revolutionize the way the infrastructure was built to a large scale, and therefore as well you know in terms of monitoring that infrastructure, but. If, if you are being honest, it did very little to the way the applications were, were run or, or were being consumed. Uh, the virtual machine revolution added new infrastructure metrics to monitor, but overall we stayed the same in terms of the application design and the way the application was developed and run and tested and consumed uh, by, by send users. So in terms of the traditional architectural pattern, which even, even, even today most of the organizations in the world run, uh, they have implemented the application built as a single autonomous unit, which with, with every unit having dependencies with each other, which requires extensive manual testing, major redevelopment work post or uh, post each upgrade and doesn't allow the application components to be monitored individually or being independent of each other. So after the VMs, like when after this VM resolution came the advent of cloud and that was a major breakthrough in the industry with the with the introduction of a platform as a service and, in, and infrastructure as a service uh, coming into the picture. These trends added added some more metrics uh, to monitor, but it also added kind of certain complexity to the overall environment in which the applications were still being run. So the application architectures fundamentally remained the same uh, even after the advent of cloud. So what changed? Uh, containerization came into the picture, basically that changed the way everything was run. So things finally started to change from an application design perspective uh, with the introduction of modern container platforms, uh, like primarily Docker being the one when, when it was introduced uh, to the world uh, starting 2013. Once Docker came into the picture, everybody started to have an understanding of how, what are containers, how containers can help to create stateless applications, which will be smaller in size individually, but they'll be 10 times more impactful within the environment in terms of scale and number and the way they are, way they are written and the way they, they are designed and, and implemented uh, within a containerized stack. Uh, so this led to the beginnings of containerized infrastructure uh, to, run, to run basically these containerized workloads, which were, be, which were uh, definitely be uh, were more transient uh, which meant that these stateless applications moved between the host servers constantly. Uh, they were more scalable. They were denser in terms of uh, their footprint within within the within the infrastructure environment that that uh, companies had. So also in addition to this, uh, because of the container portability, uh, it it encouraged a lot of industries to adopt uh, sort of multi-cloud strategies, uh, which added even more complexity to the to the existing environments. Uh, so all in all, uh, due to all of this, uh, what, what happened is that the applications over the past few years have grown significantly more complicated. Uh, so complicated, in fact, that you can't extend the monitoring strategy that worked for uh, virtual machines in the past uh, and expect it to work for, uh, for containers and container setup as well. Okay, so 
containers came, containerized uh, applications came, and then with the, with the advent of that came Kubernetes as being the as being the the biggest containerized infrastructure platform that everybody started to implement in the has or has or have started to implement in the last few years. Uh, but with with Kubernetes comes along with uh, like it brings its own complexity, it brings its own concepts, it brings its own uh, fundamental uh, fundamental aspects of it, which which are needed to basically run your run your stateless applications or in a containerized fashion. So, running an application or running production applications in a containerized Kubernetes infrastructure uh, requires you to keep track of your clusters, your pods, your containers, uh, your deployments, your config maps. Then you have CSI plugins now coming in. You have container networking infrastructure uh, setups. You have different options in that. You have Flannel option, you have Calico, you have WeaveNet. Uh, you have auto scaling features coming in. Uh, if you are provisioning your instances uh, on, a, on a cloud provider basis using AWS or Azure, so there's so many different moving parts uh, in in a complex architecture, or all intertwined with each other, uh, which uh, makes it really difficult uh, to run production grade applications. Uh, and consider this uh, multiplied into say hundreds or thousands of clusters that many large applications, uh, I'm sorry, many large companies run today uh, uh, in, in their setups. And, and with that, what, what happens is that it brings, because of this complexity, uh, all, of, all of the different, different things that, that are running uh, in, in sync, with, it, in sync with, it, with each other, uh, a lot of things break uh, in, in Kubernetes. You have applications that continuously scale, scale up and then scale down to zero. You need to keep a track of that. You have load balancing involved uh, to navigate traffic across application deployments. Uh, there are memory leak problems within containers. Certain applications are single threaded. In a way, they are written, which results in slow, slow API response times uh, out of their methods or functions. Uh, Kubernetes itself reaches, uh, like the, the architectural components of Kubernetes reach certain limits. You have out of memory killing the ports. You have crash loop back off. Uh, Errors happening happening across deployments. You have XCD quorum issues, uh, which happens uh, across your master node components. You have resource contention continuously happening uh, on a, on a large scale, uh, based on your based on your underlying infrastructure, and all of these reasons basically amount to uh, your cluster performance and uptime being impacted uh, to a, to a large extent. Uh, without uh, without having without having a solid monitoring system or a solid monitoring strategy uh, in place uh, with that i'll, I'll let uh, yeah, my colleague Jean to speak more about uh, what observability is and, and and what are the different pillars of observability and how how can we uh, approach uh, kubernetes and and containerized infrastructure monitoring uh, by by taking the correct uh, by approaching it using the correct methodology. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjit. So, um, I would like to uh, speak about in a, in a uh, different ways, like uh, the pillars of observability. So, as we know, uh, we categorize the three as the three major pillars of observability: the metrics, the logging, and the tracing. So, um, we we can uh, uh, you know uh, uh, call it like metrics as the what, and logging as the why, and the tracing as the where. So uh, this logging, tracing, and monitoring are in the different words for the same process. So you know the metrics are actually a numeric representation of data measured over a, a time, an interval of time. So metrics provides an insight into the system's behavior. Like uh, we have to choose the metrics that provides uh, uh, metrics such as like CPU, memory usage, say disk I/O. So this this uh, metrics really helps in terms of you know having an insight to the system. So um, so an application metrics for a, a service discovery feature in your monitoring tool is, is very essential. So uh, the application metrics is that they are uh, system scooped, making it hard to understand anything else other than what's happening inside a particular system. And so uh, for metrics, we kind of use some many of the open source tools like uh, uh, Prometheus. So Prometheus scraps the metrics and stores uh, time series in the DB. Um, we have these collectors acting as a non-exporters, which uh, and it helps in evaluation. 
and also uh, we have this alert manager for sending out the alerts if at a specific threshold. So metrics uh, is really helping in, in terms of identifying those informations. And uh, as we know, the metric is not only uh, the primary uh, factor which we can identify uh, or conclude the observability. So we have this logging. So uh, logging, uh, the purpose of logging is to track error reporting and related data in a centralized way. So uh, generally the logs are either stored locally or remotely, like a centralized storage for analysis. Um, so uh, the use case where it comes is like, suppose an in, uh, engineer reports some application or service is being uh, behaving abnormal. So we can look into this logs um, and this logs provides us more clarity. And that's how we can you know troubleshoot or understand like uh, what went wrong. So uh, logging should be uh, uh, used in applications, specifically if, if they provide a crucial function. So uh, we have to make sure this logging is uh, also, also being you know, taken into consideration. So uh, we have open source tools associated with this, like say Elasticsearch or Logstash that has been used widely, that is a, a widely used common open source tool. So uh, now moving to the traces. Uh, so, where the logs provides an overview to the discrete and event triggering logs, traces and comes to a much wider or continuous work of an application. So the goal of tracing is uh, is to follow uh, a program's flow and uh, data progression. So by uh, uh, tracing to a stack, developers can identify bottleneck and focus on improving the performance. Um, so that's where it's, uh, tracing really helps. So in, in simple, uh, we can say tracing uh, uh, tells a story uh, of a transition or a workflow as it propagates through the distributed system. So uh, one of the uh, widely used uh, uh, example I can point is uh, service mesh. So in service mesh, we have you know, micro services which has been distributed and uh, we can trace it using the open source tool called Gali or Jagir. So these are the widely used uh, tools that has been uh, used in terms of tracing. So these are the uh, three major pillars in observability. So moving ahead, um, when it comes to the uh, Kubernetes, we have uh, a, we should be taking a three tier approach uh, in terms of monitoring the Kubernetes. Um, so uh, monitor your infrastructure, uh, it's like uh, collecting metrics about the infrastructure availability, the virtualization content, uh, and the capacity and the performance. So uh, this is how we, you know, we can, uh, this is one of the approach that we should be taking in terms of monitoring your infrastructure because infrastructure plays a vital role. And uh, as you know, the Kubernetes will be deployed uh, in a distributed way. So uh, that's monitoring the infrastructure is uh, one of the uh, um, approach that we should be uh, taking in terms of Kubernetes monitoring. And the other important factors like checking your logs, like uh, you don't have to, uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, log all the all the uh, logs for the application. So that's where which uh, we have to be cautious enough, right? Uh, what are the important sources of uh, uh, logs of visibility taken into consideration? Like uh, say a country software stack, especially, you know, these uh, stacks will help us uh, in uh, understanding what actually happened uh, if there's a transit infrastructure. So uh, we have to identify which specific logs or um, needs to be enabled and uh, uh, the logs are also very important. So the last one is using APMs. So it's like application performance management. So at the end of the day, we would be deploying our application in the Kubernetes environment. So APS is a capability to understand the performance of an application, uh, including uh, the end user, each part of the application, like say application dependencies, dependencies uh, why application exists or like common issues and uh, you know, collaboration through, uh, throughout the team and the support environment. So all these factors come into the picture on when we talk about application performance management. So we have a lot of APM tools um, that has been uh, you know, available. So we have to make sure we kind of integrate them, but uh, just with APM tools, we won't uh, solve all of the Kubernetes monitoring challenges, but uh, they can help to determine where the issues exist and uh, uh, who the issues impact and uh, what uh, would be the root cause. So um, AMP is, is, uh, is one of the you know, crucial approach in terms of Kubernetes monitoring. Now, uh, moving on, uh, let's discuss about uh, the key pillars. Uh, there are three key pillars uh, to adopt, adopt in order to monitor the Kubernetes more efficiently. 
So I'll, uh, I'll quickly run through uh, these three points. It's like uh, we should have a dedicated team. Uh, so uh, uh, when you say a dedicated team, it's like uh, the team actually owns the Kubernetes monitoring. Even if uh, if we don't have a solved responsibility, it needs to be clear that who should be monitoring the cluster, like who is a respond, who has to respond when something goes wrong, uh, goes wrong, right? So uh, uh, the need of having a dedicated team, or at least making sure the responsibility has been properly uh, passed on, is very important uh, in terms of uh, the Kubernetes monitoring. So that's why we consider it as a one of the major pillars in adopting the monitor monitor in uh, Kubernetes. And the second point is like uh, it has to be a very user focused, not a CPU focused. So when we have this uh, AWS kind of uh, infrastructure, it's like we we kind of uh, pay them based on the usage, right? So here, uh, when when it comes to monitoring, we should take the approach about the user focus because uh, the end goal uh, is always to keep the users happy, and not to make the computer happy. So uh, uh, so we have to you know. Uh, provide uh, or give a uh, specific focus to the users like mm, the uh, in simple you can say the user satisfaction the customer satisfaction that should be the end goal so this is the another key pillar in terms of uh, monitoring that's why uh, uh, that's how we can solve major some of the major challenges of experience that we have right uh, and the other key factor is like integrating the tools because um, Kubernetes monitoring involves so many layers and becomes very complex and we cannot uh, try to collect or analyze all of the metrics in just one tool, right? So we should uh, uh, we should have a different series of tools and we have to integrate them. We have to identify which are the tools or the logs that we should be specifically looking at and uh, based on our requirement so that we can attain or provide the customer experience or the, uh, making sure our business is running smoothly. So integrating all these tools, the required tools, is, is one of the uh, important factor. So uh, yeah, so these are the main three uh, key pillars that I would uh, say in terms of uh, monitoring the Kubernetes more effect effectively. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, I'll let my colleague Sanjay talk about the uh, start journey of the Kubernetes, uh, the dashboard, and uh, what are the tools that we used in terms of monitoring. Yeah, over to you Sanjay. Thank you, Rajan. So we saw what all, what are, what are the different terminologies in terms of monitoring uh, and, and, and metrics uh, that 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 even legacy infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, and Kubernetes has. We we then saw how uh, virtual machines and containers came into the picture and and changed the way applications were designed and the need for why the need for Kubernetes came in, why the need for Kubernetes monitoring came in. Uh, we recently uh, just just uh, uh, saw what are the different uh, aspects from a theoretical perspective or from an organizational perspective that that organizations should try and implement uh, as a, as a starting point uh, when they are trying to go go through the Kubernetes journey and and the application monitoring journey. Basically, now let's now let's switch gears and and let's dive into uh, some of the some of the some of the different tools that are available. Uh, in in the in the in the market, and how how those tools uh, can help uh, organizations to implement uh, monitoring uh, like implement uh, in a better way uh, the different monitoring monitoring strategies that we discussed, uh, and how they can integrate all these all these different open source tools uh, to basically tweak and and uh, use it in a way that 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 suits best for. For their their infrastructure and their application. So, in terms of start of the journey, uh, usually when when anybody starts on on a Kubernetes journey and when they try and containerize their application uh, from from a, from a legacy legacy infrastructure or from a virtualized infrastructure, uh, the best place to start is uh, is is to is to do it do it in a small foot uh, on a small footprint, uh, like say. Run a run a single cluster with a few nodes to begin with. Try and get a grasp of what Kubernetes is, what are the different components, and integrate it into the Kubernetes uh, cluster architecture. Is the Kubernetes dashboard? Uh, the Kubernetes dashboard gives a very fundamental picture uh, of, uh, in terms of the metrics for a beginner to look at. Uh, it provides you CPU usage, memory usage per resource, or in an aggregated fashion 
for each namespace or across namespace over a period of time for, for your cluster to look at. So is this sufficient for a production grid setup? Obviously no, but for, for, a, for a user that's, that's, that's new in the market uh, or, or new in the Kubernetes space, uh, this gives you a kind of a, kind of a very uh, structural start uh, to monitor your workloads or monitor your applications in terms of CPU and memory usage and, and their consumption. Okay, now moving to the big beast uh, in, in monitoring perspective, which is Prometheus, uh, which is wherein our, our next few slides will, 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 be, uh, will be on basically. So over the past few years, uh, since Kubernetes came into the picture, side by side along with that came, came um, Prometheus, which has now become the mainstream monitoring tool of choice in the containerized and microservices world basically. Uh, so let, let's let's get let's dive deep into what what are the different components involved in Prometheus. So at its core, the Prometheus server uh, is, is what it runs and does that, does the actual monitoring work. Uh, the the stack itself, the Prometheus stack, consists of time series database basically. Uh, and when you say time series database, it it's basically stores all the metric data like current CPU usage, number of exceptions in an application in a structured fashion over a period of time that you that basically you designate. It's called, the second concept is of a data retrieval worker. Uh, what this does is that it is responsible for getting and pulling those metrics from the application, server, services, or other target resources that you would have in your infrastructure and storing them basically into this time series database. <clears throat> Once this data has been retrieved and stored, uh, it has got a web server or a server API uh, endpoint facility that accepts these queries for the stored data. So then the server API or the web server components basically are used to display this data in, in the form of a dashboard or a UI, either to the Prometheus' own dashboard, or you can have the other data visualization tool that goes hand in hand with Prometheus, which is Grafana. So like, like other monitoring systems, uh, wherein you have the applications or the servers pushing the data, pushing, pushing their metrics into a centralized uh, collection platform, Prometheus does it in, in, a, in a different way. Uh, Prometheus pulls the data uh, from the instances or from the target resources that, that you want to monitor. What happens with the push system is that it creates a high load of traffic resulting in monitoring to become the bottleneck itself. Uh, because you are pushing the data continuously to a single data source, that 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 point basically uh, is is gonna get hampered in terms of in terms of the monitoring itself, and it also requires an additional uh, additional softwares or tools are required to push those metrics to a, to that to that centralized centralized collection platform. So that, this is where in Prometheus acts in a different way. Uh, what what the pull system does is that it also provides a better detection or insight into if the service is up and running and collect the logs accordingly uh, f from those from those from those target from those targets. Uh, Prometheus also for very short lived jobs wherein wherein the pull system is isn't going to help also provides a, a push gateway concept wherein you can do the do the legacy or the or the other monitoring style style way of collecting the metrics, but you can have that as an add-on feature only for jobs which are gonna run for a very short time and wherein the full concept doesn't actually make sense. Uh, it is extremely easy to deploy uh, Prometheus uh, and Grafana and Alert Manager, all of these things using Helm charts. That's, that's the easiest way to, to deploy. You can go, go, go to the Helm website and they have, got a, they have got a Prometheus table repository and you can pull in those charts and uh, in a matter of minutes, you'll have Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, everything running uh, on your on your workload, and it will be basically ready for you to basically then start start pointing it to to the things that you want to monitor. Now, what does Prometheus monitor? Uh, we understand we understood how 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 it does work, but what what does it monitor? Why why do we need Prometheus, and what what all things does it monitor? So it could be an entire Linux or Windows server, it could be a single application, it could be an Apache server or a service like database. Uh, for all these things, uh, and, 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 and these things that basically are being targeted to be monitored uh, in, mon in Prometheus are called as targets itself. 
So each target has got different units of monitoring. So uh, consider Linux or a Windows server, you have, you'll have CPU statistics, you'll have memory or disk space usage. For uh, a standalone application, you have the request count, exception count, request duration, all these different, all these different uh, uh, API call set that will go through the application. You'll need to monitor those. So these are some of the units that we that that any kind of uh, consumer would like to monitor for 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 a specific for a specific target. In Prometheus, is is basically defined as what what is a metric that 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 we monitor. And these metrics are what get saved into the Prometheus time series database. So you have a you have a target, and and these targets have got units. These units are called as metric. These metrics get saved into time series database. It's very simple concept. Now the way in which these metrics get collected uh, and and saved, it, it's got it's got a it's got a format to that. So it's a it's a very simple human readable text based format. It's got two attributes basically. It's got a type and a help. Help is when you have the description of what the metric is. Type has its own categories. So you can have type as a counter, wherein you can uh, get how many times a certain thing happened. You can have a gauge type, wherein you can say, uh, can this service uh, or did the service go up and down uh, in terms of uh, monitoring it to, to a high and low value. And then you have the third type is, is, is the histogram, wherein you basically can uh, monitor it uh, in a way that how long did it take to reach this basic to reach this data point or how big of, of a size request it was uh, in terms of in terms of the metric itself so these are some of the metric attributes that 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 uh, that every metric has that Prometheus monitors so moving on how does Prometheus collect these metrics from the target now we understood what a metric is we understood what the target is how does Prometheus collect this so Prometheus basically pulls these metric data from, from the targets uh, via an HTTP endpoint, uh, which is by default the host address slash metric uh, as, the, as, the, as the term. So these targets, they must expose the slash metric endpoint that, that, that I just said, and the data available at that slash metric endpoint should be available in the format which Prometheus wants. So all the targets that Prometheus wants to wants to tackle, they should they should have a they should have that slash metric endpoint, and the format of the data that uh, is that that Prometheus understands the data should be in the, in that form, uh, for for Prometheus to basically scrape. It. So some of the servers uh, uh, they already expose these slash metric endpoints by default, so that there is no need uh, there is no ad additional work basically needed. To ensure that it's in the it's in the format that Prometheus wants to collect the metrics, so these are called as clients basically. So you have a concept wherein you have wherein these clients they come up with a lot of different options in terms of software defined kits that can be integrated uh, using the language of your choice, and then directly build Prometheus integration within the within the application itself. It could be a Java programming. Uh, Java could be uh, using the Java programming tool that you write a, write a Java application. You wire up Prometheus uh, during the application creation itself and have out of the box metrics for your application, which is ready for Prometheus, uh, uh, which is ready for Prometheus to be scraped out of. And then you have, then you basically have metrics collected from these target application that you built in. Uh, out of the box, uh, you don't need to do anything to ensure that it's in the format which Prometheus understands or wants. If you don't have, if you don't have that kind of an application, it's fine, uh, because not all the services or servers which uh, you want uh, Prometheus to monitor will have uh, will have that uh, native Prometheus endpoint uh, as per the format it requires. So that's where in the another component comes into picture, which is called as an exporter. Uh, exporters can can be basically in the form of a script or a service that fetches these metrics target from the that fetches the metrics basically from the target, and then converts them into the format which Prometheus understands, and then exposes the converted data at its own metric endpoint, which would be at which would be slash metric, where Prometheus can scrape it. So, if you have an exporter and and you and you have that running in your application, which is not a not a native uh, Prometheus uh, built-in application, 
exporter will basically do the job for you. It will convert it into the format which Prometheus understands and then expose that converted data to its own slash metric uh, endpoint for Prometheus to scrape it. And Prometheus has got a list of such exporters for, for all variety of different services uh, and, and systems and application and Prometheus continues to add these to, to, to it continues to add, add it to this list. So just as an example, if you want to monitor, say, a Linux server, you can just download Antar and execute uh, the node exporter, which will help to convert the metrics of that particular Linux server and expose them at the slash metric endpoint, which then you can use inside Prometheus to scrape it. These, these exporters, which I just talked about, they're also available in, as, as Docker images. So you can, you can just build, build them in as sidecar containers if you want inside your application uh, so that you don't need to uh, write, write it uh, in, the, in, the, in the application itself when you're, when you're designing it, basically. <clears throat> so Prometheus now has collected all the metrics from the target what what and and it, and it has stored it in its time series database what what do we do next with that we need to basically uh, have these metrics uh, used and targeted in a in a specific way that will provide uh, the end users or the administrative team of 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 a particular organization with alerts that that's that's our end goal so that's where in comes into comes in uh, that's where an alert manager basically comes into the picture so Prometheus basically has its own server, which will push these push the alerts to the alert manager, which will be responsible to fire these alerts uh, via email, via Slack channel, uh, via any receiver that it wants based on the rules. So you will basically configure rules inside alert manager. And then once those rules are, or, or the thresholds of the rules are met, uh, Prometheus, uh, Prometheus's metrics uh, will be pushed to the alert manager, and when the condition has been met, the alert will be fired to the receiver that that you have already configured uh, for that role, uh, which will be uh, any kind of admin uh, that will be monitoring your monitoring stack. So this is just a basic demonstration video that shows how a node exporter is, which is running inside a Kubernetes node having Prometheus, which has been run locally. So this is basically the Prometheus's dashboard and you can see different, uh, different metric, uh, metric points that you can have node disk write time uh, in milliseconds. Uh, you can have HTTP duration in microseconds. So node exporter is basically one of the type of Prometheus exporters uh, for hardware and, and uh, operating system metrics, which has got its own set of pluggable metric uh, collectors. It basically allows you to uh, measure various machine resources, uh, as I said, like memory disk utilization, CPU utilization, et cetera. So what it does is that it basically scrapes this information from the existing node or, or the device which is in place on which, on which it gets deployed. So <clears throat> in, terms of, in terms of deployment, when deploying Helm charts, uh, it, like all of these, uh, all, of the, all of the Prometheus and, and Alert Manager Comes comes into uh, comes into the picture in the form of or in the form of deployments. So you'll have you'll have certain deployments running, which will which will have the Prometheus operator running. You will have Grafana, which will be deployed as a standalone deployment. Then you'll also have something which is called as the Cube State metric, which monitors the health of your running resources, even the mon even the Prometheus resources and the other resources uh, internally itself. So. Uh, like whatever whatever deployments you have running uh, your cube controller manager your cube scheduler and stuff like that all of that will be monitored on its own by via this cube cube state metric endpoint so basically all in all you have uh, when you deploy prometheus uh, you are you cover your basis to to a, to a great to a large extent in terms of monitoring your application resources as along with that you monitor your kubernetes resources as well uh, out of the box. So moving on to Grafana. So this, this is kind of an extension of, of Prometheus. Uh, uh, it's a visualization tool. Uh, you can collect the metrics out of Prometheus and then visualize it using Grafana, which has got some awesome dashboards uh, that you can, it's got a preloaded dashboards and you can create your own dashboards as well. It uh, Prometheus allows to query uh, its metric data 
on these targets using the web server API as I discussed earlier. And the way to do that, it does it, it, does it using the PromQL query language. They, are, they have their own uh, PromQL query language, uh, which is quite easy to understand, but you need to, you need to get a hang of it to, to, to write those queries if you want to create your own, your, your own dashboards, basically. So you can use the Prometheus UI or you can use the Grafana, which uses the, prom, which uses the PromQL query language in the background. Grafana can also import data from from other resources as well. It doesn't. It, it's not like it. It can just do it uh, from from via Prometheus itself. It can it can fetch fetch the data out of Elastic Research or uh, your Elk Stack or your or your AWS RDS instance or MySQL. So you can have you can have your data pulled in via all these different resources, and then you can build your own visualization from all these different resources into a single pane of glass. That in your lab data from say a Kubernetes cluster, and you'll have your, you'll have your data coming from your Elk stack as well, uh, that you can visualize visualize in the single pane of glass. So this one is basically a demonstration wherein uh, on a, on, a, on a standalone uh, single node master single node uh, master uh, Kubernetes cluster, I have uh, the Linkerd uh, deployment running. Uh, and this is the Linkerd dashboard that comes in uh, along along with the deployment itself. And if we can see, it's, it's got its own Prometheus uh, uh, Prometheus pod running, which comes out of the box when you deploy the Linkerd Linkerd uh, application, and it has got its own Grafana dashboard as well. And this this gives you a picture of how Grafana looks. You can get pods for memory usage and network I/O for your pods and uh, the network pressure across the namespace and then you can go and go and specifically target uh, uh, a particular deployment as well that you want to that you want to monitor across any namespace to see uh, the request rate for that particular application uh, and and what what has been the latency and, and stuff like that so you you have these uh, applications that i that i discussed already right you can have these application uh, which will have the client tools basically having Prometheus running in 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 the as a as a as a part of the application itself, or you can have have them running as as separate standalone ports coming in with the application itself, like like this one has, and you have all the Linkerd metrics coming in, and you have the Grafana dashboard uh, deployed as deployed as deployed as a pod as well uh, along with it. That that basically provides you like a like a complete. Uh, a, a separate monitoring uh, monitoring resource for your application uh, as a as a as a sole application itself, and this is how basically uh, you can see that uh, how in a general way the integration works. You have uh, Prometheus, uh, which is which is like pulling the metrics from the application. It's pushing it to Alert Manager. Grafana is uh, using PromQL to show it in the visualization. You have got we got the node exporters, uh, which is pulling the data out of the, out of the third party application. So all in all, you kind of get to get in a sense of uh, how, how the things, how things are integrated uh, in, uh, in a complete, in a complete stack perspective. <clears throat> Moving on to federation. So Prometheus uh, has got its own feature wherein you can federate the Prometheus server. So, Federation basically uh, is is an hierarchical structure wherein each cluster can set up its own Prometheus server, which will be responsible for scraping the data in the cluster, or one can set up a Prometheus server, uh, which will be then responsible for scraping the data from the other individual Prometheus server. So here the Promethe here the federated Prometheus server will also monitor the individual Prometheus metrics as well. So it's got like two categories. The first is the hierarchy federation, uh, wherein in, in uh, the federation topology resembles basically a tree tree style topology, wherein the higher level Prometheus global Prometheus server will collect the aggregated time series data from a from a large number of different subordinate Prometheus servers, uh, and then you have got cross federate cross service type of federation, wherein you have uh, say a Prometheus server for one service which is configured to scrape selected data from another services Prometheus server to enable alerting and queries against both the data sets into a single server. So in terms of configuring it uh, on any given Prometheus server, you can expose the slash federate endpoint. 
which allows for retrieving the current value of the selected time series data in that server and, and it needs to be specified for a match URL parameter to select the series that you want to expose. So if, if for us to federate the metrics from one server to the other, we have to configure the destination Prometheus server as well, which will scrape uh, scrape the slash federate endpoint from the source server while on while enabling the honor label scrape option as well, so that no no labels are being overwritten uh, which are being exposed by the source server basically. Uh, what federation provides is that you, it provides uh, a way in which you can capture the selective and aggregated time series data from each individual cluster, which will ensure that less space is being consumed uh, for that particular uh, for that particular Prometheus server, and it, and it, it will provide you basically an aggregated data that you can have longer retention period, say one year or whatever. Also, what Federation provides you is that it provides you a unified display of data, so you don't need to go and look back at individual cluster. You can have uh, data at a single point, wherein uh, it, it's an aggregated data, wherein you have what you need it basically, and then you can even have federated dashboards, uh, which are running, uh, which you can run across all the clusters that you have uh, basically uh, collected the information and federated. Quickly moving into uh, Elf stack, I'll let uh, my colleague Ajon uh, tell you about this. Thanks, Sanjit. So, um, Snil has clearly mentioned about like the Prometheus and working and like how it can be integrated with the federated. Um, so, uh, now let's discuss about a different uh, stack that is called the ELK. So, it's uh, Elastic Search and Lock Stack and Kibana. These are the three uh, tools that have been stacked together. So uh, this software, uh, we can call this Stack. Uh, it really helps um, to take data from any kind of source and uh, maybe it uh, formatted or unformatted unstructured data. So um, this helps, uh, you know, in performing searching, analyzing and visualizing this um, data for determining the patterns in real time. So this is also one of the monitoring tools that we use, uh, with, uh, say, from the properties uh, and this uh, Grafana. Uh, so it, in a similar way, we have this ELK stack where we uh, you know, take the data and uh, search it using the elastic search and then show in a visualization format. So uh, with the help of uh, centralized logging, you can identify the problem of an application. So uh, you can look for all the logs from a single platform. So it's a different uh, platform altogether. Uh, when it com compares with the Prometheus and Grafana. So um, let's let's uh, explain about these three different stacks, I mean, the components in these stacks. So let's take Elasticsearch. So um, I'll quickly run through the, all these components here. So Elasticsearch uh, is the, you, know, you can call this a heart of this uh, software stack because it's basically has, uh, has no SQL database. You know, it uh, stores data simply for looking uh, at uh, quickly and you know, it offers uh, queries for better data analysis. And uh, you know we has the index uh, heterogeneous data, so uh, offers you know uh, a real uh, real time search that you know we can find the uh, documents right after uh, they are indexed. So that's how it provides you know, a real time um, you know search. We can update and add more uh, data to so document in the real time, which which is a plus when it comes to the remaining monitoring stacks. Um, and the advantage is it offers a geolocation support and a multi-language support. And, and it also has this um, multi-document API for handling individual records. So uh, it combining together, you know, can say Elastic uh, as the whole the software stack, which takes care of all the uh, heavy lifting work. And um, log stack uh, is another piece of uh, ELK stack where which, you know, it fetches the input and feed it to the elastic search so it takes uh, gathers or uh, collects data um, available for using it further it also helps to clean the data for further use and you know um, it can support a huge array of data types so in other words uh, uh, it is it processes log messages enhance them and sends them to the destination so that is a major functionality of log stats which uh, you know, which acts as a first level of for the elastic Engine. And once we have this logs uh, fetched and uh, fed to the elastic search, and uh, in a simple manner, we need to have it in a visualization format. So that's where Kibana brings in. So this is the tool that has been used for visualization in the ELK stack. So it, it has this functionality of exploring a large volume of data 
It has an extensive dashboard that uh, has uh, mainly uh, features as the graphs and diagrams, which uh, you know when you compare with Grafana, it has it reads the metrics, but here it shows the uh, you know visualizations in a better way. And, and uh, we can use this uh, Kibana for searching and integrating, uh, and uh, you know mainly integrating with the uh, Elasticsearch data that uh, contained in this instance. And uh, the other uh, uh, beauty about Kibana and Elke uh, Stack is that it can run on uh, independent of the platform. It does not has to be on a specific platform, and it also has this real time uh, visualization of indexing data. And uh, like I said, it has multiple, you know, multi-language support. Like uh, it runs on Node.js to get a necessary uh, package along with the installation. So uh, its installation is pretty uh, uh, normal, where we know we can easily integrate with the monitoring the stacks. And uh, yeah, uh, now uh, uh, when we say about real case, uh, use cases like. Uh, so, you know, uh, we can use it for the event logging uh, and another, uh, you know, promising practice to process a big amount of data. So that is a, the piece in upper hand uh, in terms of uh, uh, selecting the mounting stack. And uh, it has this long-term data storage and we have this, uh, uh, we can uh, implement in a clustered solution uh, across a distributed. So this, this is the gist of the DLK stack uh, when compared with Prometheus and uh, so uh, moving to the next slide, uh, let's let's uh, discuss about uh, how does uh, Prometheus kind of uh, not solve everything. Like right? so, we, we're trying to understand whether Prometheus kind of solves all of the uh, problems that we have. Uh, so uh, the major difference between uh, is that Prometheus is used in metric collections, various system monitoring and uh, setting up alerts based on this metric. But whereas this ELK has uh, been used in all types of data and performing uh, different types of analytics based on these data and searching uh, on these data uh, database and visualizing it. So these are the two major differences between the Prometheus and the ELK stack. So, uh, so does this Prometheus kind of solve all the, all the uh, requirement that, uh, does this Prometheus meet all the requirement that we have or, uh, uh, or uh, do we need a better tool for it? So, uh, we have to say like Prometheus does not uh, provide some of the capabilities that you expect from a full-fledged um, as a service platform because uh, I'll list a couple of um, you know uh, um, uh, capabilities that Prometheus is kind of missing such as like multi-tenancy you know authentication authorization and building a long-term storage these are the major missing parts uh, which Prometheus is lacking so uh, I'll elaborate a bit more on those points like uh, long term storage is like uh, an individual Prometheus uh, instance provides durable storage of uh, time series of data, but they do not act as a distributed storage. When it comes to a Kubernetes, obviously, in a distributed system, right? And this uh, feature like cost, not replication, and automatic repair. Uh, this means that durability guarantees are restricted to uh, that of a single machine. So uh, even though the Prometheus offers a re uh, remote write API that can be used to pipe time series data to other systems, but which becomes more difficult, difficult and extra overhead. But um, you know this, this is the uh, one of the major uh, you know lag where Prometheus has. Uh, the other other uh, factor uh, is uh, the global view of data, uh, um, like described. Uh, you know uh, uh, the Prometheus instance acts as a isolated data storage unit. Uh, like we saw earlier in uh, Prometheus, uh, instance can be federated, uh, but that adds more, uh, but some level of complexity to the Prometheus setup again. So um, uh, the reason why we moved into the Kubernetes is like making it very simpler to deploy and maintain, right? So when it comes like rated, so the complexity level of setting up a Prometheus increases again. So uh, uh, the Prometheus simply won't build in a distributed database. So this means that there is no simple path to achieving the single consistent or a kind of a global view. Uh, so that's the other second missing piece that this uh, Prometheus has. And then the other one is like uh, the multi-tenant. The Prometheus by itself has no built-in concept of a tenant. So which means that uh, it does not provide any sort of fine granulated uh, control over like tenant uh, specific data access and uh, resource using usage quota. Uh, if I have a distributed environment in a different cluster, so the data that is being scrapped will not uh, have this information about the tenants. So uh, from the Prometheus dashboard, uh, 
we won't be able to see or you know categorize or group based on this uh, centralized view so this tendency uh, the multi tenancy uh, feature is kind of a missing or uh, in the prometheus so uh, how we can solve these or how can we fill these gaps so that's where which you know we uh, we can take a next tool or called uh, uh, cortex so this this is kind of an extension or kind of a uh, tool where it uh, fills the gaps where the prometheus is lagging so uh, uh, cortex is of course a open source uh, prometheus as a service platform that's uh, that seeks to fill the gaps and uh, you know thereby provide a complete secure um, multi tenant prometheus experience so it's it's kind of a you know uh, upgraded version i would say uh so as a prometheus as a service platform cortex uh, fills in all these you know crucial gaps with um you know um and it's provide a complete out of box solution for uh, even the most demanding monitoring and uh, observability use cases so uh let's let's take a couple of you know um use cases where which uh, the cortex brings in this you know uh, or fills the gaps so uh it supports a for long term storage system uh, out of the box which the prometheus was missing um, like uh, the uh, long term storage systems was like uh, say cassandra uh, uh, aws s3 and the we have this uh, google cloud big table so these are the uh, major uh, storage which has been provided by uh, in supported in cortex and also it offers a global view of the prometheus uh, time series data that includes uh, data in a long a long term storage is a uh, greatly expanding the usefulness of the promq for uh, analytical purposes because uh, you know uh, from, uh, from if i have a multi cluster setup uh, as a not been or as a you know as a customer i would be you know more happy to see everything in a in a centralized tabular format where i can see all the data that is required so uh, that's where this cortex offers this functionality and this has this uh, like i said the uh, built in multi tenancy features like uh, all the prometheus metrics which pass through the cortex is associated with a specific tenant so i'll uh, describe a bit i'll just show the uh, architectural uh, structure how co uh, cortex is being deployed um, and the components the major components that is being uh, involved in co cortex so if you if you see here the it's like shows like uh, the the uh, main architecture about um what is cortex and how, what are the major uh, uh components that are involved in achieving this and how we can integrate this prometheus and all uh, in terms of you know sending alerts what all the uh, plugins we can add and integrate so uh, i'll uh, uh, talk about a couple of the major uh, components which uh, plays a crucial role in cortex so um the functionality uh, the essential functionality is split up into a single purpose component that uh, that can be in, uh, independently scaled which is a very uh, uh, important factor here um, so i'll, I'll uh, talk about um, the major uh, uh, four uh, components that are present in the cortex to achieve this that is a distributor and then uh, then we have the ruler uh, then we have the ingester then we have the curer so these are the uh, four major uh, components that are present here so uh, distributor is like uh, it handles the uh, time series data written by the cortex uh, by prometheus instance uh, using the prometheus api so the incoming data is automatically replicated and sh shattered and sent to multiple uh, cortex ingesters in parallel so uh, the ingesters and receive this uh, uh, time series data from the distributor nodes and then writes uh, to the long term uh, storage backend and uh, compressing uh, compressing data into the prometheus chunks of efficiency uh, and then the uh, ruler executes and generates alerts uh, and you know we make use of the alert manager which by default is installed with uh, cortex and you now that uh, alert managers can be used in sending alerts to the you know uh, admins or the associates uh, in terms of is a spike and based on the, based on the uh, the rules that is set Okay, and then we have courier. It's like uh, handles prompt QL queries from the clients, uh, like a uh, you know abstracting our both uh, ephemeral time series data and uh, assembling in long term storage. So uh, this really helps in terms of an overall kind of a, uh, solving the major uh, gaps which was Prometheus missing. So um, this is a, a very quick uh, walkthrough on uh, Cortex and. Uh, now i'll uh, you know uh, i'll uh, mention about the um, uh, other uh, key factors like the <clears throat> that we saw in the previous slides 
so in the uh, diagram earlier we kind of saw the uh, uh, cortex completes the form of this monitoring system right so, uh, to work the system installation we just need to reconfigure our existing uh, prometheus instance to uh, read out the uh, write to the cortex cluster and then cortex will take it uh, take care of the rest so it's like an extended version like i said extended version of the prometheus which all the missing gaps have been filled right so uh, let's discuss about the multi tenancy uh, uh, that has been uh, you know uh, implemented with uh, uh, cortex so that single tenant systems are fine for a small use cases and uh, non production environments but uh, when it comes to a large org organization with a, a large number of teams the use cases the environment and the com the systems and the, everything becomes more complex and uh, so to meet the tax saving requirement of for such organization cortex provides a multi tenancy not as an add on or a plug in but rather a first class compatibility so uh, like all the uh, uh, for example like um, is a um, a time series of data that arrives in uh, cortex from prometheus instance is marked and uh, belonging to a specific tenant in the request metadata so uh, that's how we can uh, you know separate the or bring in the multi tenancy feature with the uh, cortex um, now uh the data uh that has been you know scrapped from the prometheus from the is with the different tenants that can be queried uh by the same tenants and uh, we can uh use this for alt uh you can use the alert manager and configure it sending out the alerts you can integrate with the slack or any other uh you know alert the way that we have to uh, send alerts to the admins so um each tenant has its own view uh the prometheus uh prometheus centric uh world at its disposal so uh uh, we do not use cortex in a single tenant fashion because it becomes ad or extra overhead and does not meet the purpose right so uh, the cortex has been generally used in a multi tenant or in a very complex distributed environments so on uh, all the places where the uh, uh, the prometheus uh, the features which prometheus lack right so uh, we, we can ex uh, expand out of the uh, independency in a large pool of uh, multi tenants at any time so uh the other uh, uh, important thing which i like to call upon is in terms of the uh, the components that can be independently scaled in uh, cortex like all the major components like distributor ingester and a ruler all this can be properly uh, configured or tuned based on the requirement that we have like the way we have to uh, send alerts based on the traffic uh, how uh, cortex has been managing it so uh, this this is the a very quick overview about the cortex so uh, Moving next, so how we should be uh, setting on the uh, you know self service Q Kubernetes monitoring in an ideal scenario? I'll uh, let my colleague to take it over. Hey, yeah, you, Sandeep. So we just saw all the different tools that that are available uh, in the in the in the in the open source world right now. And there are many other than these as well, which which are being developed uh, on a on a on a daily basis or a yearly basis, but. Uh, from an from an organizational perspective uh, rather than having all these services and you you have your own infrastructure you have your own application and you have your own monitoring uh, monitoring team as well uh, doing all the all the heavy lifting rather than that what can be an ideal ideal scenario or an ideal solution to to all these problems that that we saw and that all these different concepts is basically having a having a self service kubernetes uh, saas managed offering uh, which will which should basically provide an easy and a self service way to access the monitoring data uh, this particular so software as a service solution would collect the data automatically for its users which they can view anytime using grafana or prometheus dashboards uh, which would be built into the to the kubernetes offering itself uh, and they can view it at the click of a button for the relevant cluster uh it would also uh, help if it has a visual alarm over you where one can keep track of alerts and for the subscribe to them uh, so basically all in all uh, you just you don't have to worry about anything uh, everything can be uh, you just have to deploy your cluster and you will have the monitoring in place uh, as well uh, to to basically ensure that your application runs uh, uh, 100% of the time along with that uh, to use uh, if if the if the saas managed offering also has its own kubernetes internal monitoring setup that would even make like things even 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 better the solution then would offer the user management experience by having 
its own internal monitoring setup, which would alert the customer to specific scenarios based on the data that they would collect, uh, which the customers will then be notified. Essentially, what this will do is that it will provide the best of both worlds, the ability for, for organizations and for the customer to dive deep into monitoring uh, the data themselves uh, via all the tools that, that will be exposed and also have an hands-off approach by letting the internal monitoring do the work uh, that, that they wish for that uh, the clusters would run on any premises or, 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 on, uh, or, any, or on any multi-cloud environment without having to worry about uh, worry about certain specific things. So that that's uh, that's an ideal scenario and an ideal solution that uh, that 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 needs to be that needs to be in place for uh, organizations to leverage so that they 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 focus on their application or designing and development and not worry about all the all the all the things that 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 are there. Uh, but yeah, essentially this provides the best of both scenarios, uh, uh, and that's what that's what we basically wanted to cover. Uh, wanted to provide a brief overview of all the different problems that are there and how to solve those problems. What are the tools available, and uh, basically uh, what what can be done uh, for 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 anybody who's starting in this space. Uh, just just as an overview. Uh, yeah, with that, uh, it, it's it's a wrap. Uh, we'll definitely take any questions that that uh, that you guys have. Uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, and thank you, Akil, for uh, for working with me as well.